shade. Good morning again, made it to Friday, uh, got to work out quick, got to work at 11, so I've got about an hour to get this done, just Friday. so I can get ready and whatnot. Uh, got to work out quick. But essentially, yeah, the usual, please join in, chill, ask me anything, anytime. You're going to be listening to the stuff that I listen to in the background, mostly news stuff, comedy news, but yeah. Students, welcome back to the Philip Franco Show. Buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm splitting $10,000 across 10 lucky subscribe beautiful bastards this month. And let's just jump into it. Okay, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is fantastic fucking news for about 20 million Americans and pretty great news for 23 million more. So maybe I should pull back on the word fantastic because if you look on social media right now, yes, you have people that are happy, but also people are fucking furious. With some on one side saying, fuck you, this is nowhere near enough. Whereas on the complete polar opposite, you have people saying, fuck you, this shouldn't even be happening. Happening. Right, what we're talking about and what they're reacting to is the Biden administration announcing today that they are canceling up to $20,000 in student debt for Pell Grant recipients and up to $10,000 for non-Pell Grant recipients. And in both of those instances, you're eligible for the relief if your individual income is under $125,000 per year. And in addition to that, they're extending the pause on loan repayments we'll by one month. So once those repayments are the toes guys exercise. The fact that Biden also capped monthly it works payments the for loans at 5% of the borrower's discretionary income, well. which is half the 10% rate so the borrowers had to pay everything. before under most plans. And the White House is saying that it will lower the average annual student loan payment by more than $1,000 a year. Now, before moving forward, if you are someone that this affects, you need to know this. Reportedly, the Department of Education lacks income data for most Americans with student debt. In fact, the White House says that it expects that only around 8 million of the 43 million eligible borrowers may be eligible to get their relief automatically because their income is available to the department. But for everyone else, the administration says that it's setting up a simple application process for borrowers to claim relief, it's saying that it'll be ready no later than the end of the year when the freeze on loan repayments expire. You know, one of the most interesting parts of this story is how are people receiving this news? And so this morning, I asked on Twitter, for those of you affected by this, what are your thoughts? And so let's go through some of it together. Absolutely beyond relief. It's not enough and there should be a tiered system, not income cap. Shouldn't be punished for succeeding in our career since college, especially those with significant debt who went into competitive and or high yielding field. Cried, this will take out most of my student debt. It's not even remotely a dent in my debt for my two degrees. It's irritating. My wife and I have worked our asses off, skipped vacations, never upgraded our one car, 2008 with 250,000 miles, and lived way below our means for years to pay off our loans. Our friends traveled, new cars, paying the minimum, and now we're getting those loans reduced. Also, in addition to those, I've seen people online saying they feel like they're being penalized because they chose not to go to college, instead took on debt from, you know, trying to start their own small business, stuff like that. But of course, all that is just a small snapshot, and so I want to pass the question off to y'all watching here, oh, right, my biggest usual. audience. What are your thoughts? Once we get to take my progress the shot. Then, you know, the, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle once said, girls just want to have fun, but that's stupid. Everyone wants to have fun, including felons. I didn't my arms. And so those are actually prisoners, and yes, they're racing around the courtyard of France's second largest prison, which is a facility housing an estimated 2,000 men and 100 women and just south of Paris, which, as a side note, kind of blew me away because in America, Rikers is the second largest prison in the United States, and that has almost 14,000 inmates. Just a fun little fact about the, the country with the world's highest incarceration rate. But back to France, who had 25 minutes of video coming to light last week. It's the first time I've done this exercise, so... against one another and even throwing um, water balloons at passing go-karts. With other activities, including tug of war and obstacle course, you know, all this stuff we saw for the reasons a day of fun parodying a French reality TV show similar so to Survivor. It's being organized by a local man who was totally done similar games for years, like a sports like competition between police and youngsters back in June. But you know, with this, over the past several days, as the video has caught traction, we've seen France's right leaning political parties slamming the prison administration as well as the government for allowing this to take place. With center right opposition lawmaker Eric Ciotti saying, Our prisons are not holiday camps where prisoners and guards make bonds of friendship. And the outrage intensified after it was reported that two of the inmates playing tug of war had been convicted of murder. 
murder and rape. But then with that, the organizer says that it was made clear that anyone convicted of a violent offense could not take part. And a prison official saying none of them were convicted of murder or rape. And so in response to the prison's governor at first defending the event, but then later saying that it was a mistake, with most of the anger then being directed at France's justice it's minister, bad, Eric Dupont Moretti. Because reports claimed that the official was raising from the it's highest level of the ministry. Which he actually denied, saying the fight against reoffending involves rehabilitating, but <sighs> certainly doesn't involve go-karting. Had I known there'd be a go-karting contest, I would have imposed a very clear ban. And so he orders an investigation, and yesterday that produced a nine-page report saying that the ministry did give permission, but that it didn't have specific details about go-karting. The minister adding that new conditions would be circulated to prisons on the type of rehabilitation projects that could be allowed. Which overall feels like the very involved and random backstory to why, if you went to a prison, there was a sign that says, no go-karting, which someone would then read and be like, what the fuck? What happened? Why is a go-kart ban necessary here because of this? But, you know, with all of this, it does raise important questions about how we should treat our incarcerated <sighs> population. Because, you know, a lot of people have seen pictures of those luxurious prisons in countries like Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, where rehabilitation is the focus instead of retribution, and advocates argue that recidivism rates are then low. But, of course, on the other side of this, you have people saying prison is meant to be a punishment. Don't reward them or pamper them. And personally, I understand why there's debate, and I get the concern because, look, like, that looks better than my regular day. You're telling me that if I commit a crime, my punishment is a roof over my head, a bed, three meals a day, and go-karts with the boys? I don't know, that sounds pretty fucking dope. And then, I want to talk about this political controversy out of Finland, because oh, wouldn't it be nice if this could be our fucking, like, political controversy? And you know, when it comes to politicians and parties, politicians can get in trouble. Justin Trudeau, I hear he's a fan of costume parties. Boris Johnson, Parties that are worth losing your job over, apparently. But now, in the spotlight, you have Finnish Prime Minister Santa Marin. But they're apologizing this morning after a topless photo was being circulated on social media. Though notably, it was not a photo of her. Instead, it was a Finnish social media influencer and a friend kissing and flashing the camera, though uh, covering it up with a Finland sign. But all of this reportedly taking place at the Prime Minister's residence, where there was a party last month where Marin had invited guests over after a music festival. We've also seen her trying to distance herself from the photo, saying, I think the picture is not I'm just trying to figure out where this exercise fits for it, the picture out. should not have been taken. Also saying that despite the photo may make it seem like the event was actually not that eventful. Saying that there was more of a kickback where they were just being hung out in the sun and where otherwise nothing extraordinary happened. This is actually the second time she's apologized in the last week for party. Or before this, she had made headlines when videos came out of her drinking and dancing at a private party. With allegations that there were illicit drugs being used, followed by another night of her dancing at a nightclub. Marin has denied taking any drugs at any point in her life and passed a drug test. But still regarding drinks, her opponents claimed that her drinking could impair her judgment, which she countered by saying that she kept her drinking to a minimum at such parties. Her opponents also claiming that her choice of friends left much to be desired and that such videos could expose her to blackmail. But, notably, at the same time, she actually has a lot of supporters with all of this happening. The actual impact oh. of these controversies has been very minimal. Oh, Across social media, we've seen tons of Finnish women posting videos of them dancing and drinking to show support. And then her government key allies have mentioned that this is really nothing to write home about, or they were confused and tired of people asking questions about the photos and videos. This is likely not going to be the last of it, with Marin also openly admitting that other photos and videos likely exist and saying, I feel like footage is being shot of me all the time everywhere and it doesn't feel good even normal things are made to look bad and yeah my reaction to this is really this is your controversy our last guy inspired a mob to attack the capital and before that guy we had another president that had an employee blow him at work and then he used the political muscle around him to villainize her whereas from what i'm seeing from these accounts with this prime minister this is just someone blowing off steam with other consenting adults this is nothing and if you live there you should count yourself lucky that this is a controversy. And then, you know, uncertainty in the market might have you wondering where to invest. And you may want to consider private market assets like startups, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio. You know, historically, only wealthy investors with few exceptions have had access to these types of investments. But thanks to today's sponsor, Republic, that changes. Republic's a global private investing platform making it possible for everyone to invest in private assets from startups, real estate, music, crypto projects, art, and more. Our team of investment professionals curate private investment opportunities with high growth potential, from pitch decks, SEC documents, to social media, press, and company updates, seeing deal information all in one place makes it easier than ever to do your due diligence. And you can invest as little as $100 on the Republic app or desktop and use their autopilot feature to find deals that match your investment preferences. Just click that link below to sign up and use my referral code below to get up to $100 when you make an investment. If you're new to investing, you can start low and invest $200 in the company that you believe in and 
get $10 off with code Phil10. And actually, if you want to invest more, let's say $2,000 or more, you can get $100 off using code Phil100. Then, Sony is currently facing a nearly $6 billion lawsuit in the UK right now. And that for allegedly ripping off its consumers and violating the country's competition laws. So the lawsuit was filed at the Competition Appeal Tribunal and is led by consumer rights advocate Alex Neal, who notably has a 14-year history with these kinds of suits. And the suit claims that Sony used the PlayStation Store's position as the only digital marketplace for the platform to abuse no the and publishers by charging excessive fees. Actually, have a chat about the swivel. Commission. And that, in turn, uh, allegedly led to customers being unwittingly right overcharged for digital stop purchases stop on the platform. The lawsuit is estimating the customers overpaid a total of $5 billion like over the past six years. And it's estimated that individuals in the claim, which is just about any UK-based PlayStation owner, could get between roughly the equivalent of 80 to 660 yeah. US dollars, depending on how much stuff they bought from the store. Now, notably, this type of anti-competition class action lawsuit is actually fairly new in the UK, with it only beginning to allow them in 2015. And in fact, with this case, there are still a lot of steps for any consumer to see the money. For the first big hurdle is that the competition appeal tribunal needs to certify this as eligible to proceed to trial, there then being a matter of, well, actually winning the trial itself, which, according to some, may be a long shot. For the crux of the claim is that Sony is abusing developers and customers with this case, but it's, it's, Sony. it's an industry across the board and seen on the Apple Store, Android Play, Steam, and it's always good to try different so exercises. Why Sony the body does plateau in a while because the body gets used to the exercise that you've been doing. That's why it's always good to be setting up some other big issues in the case. They kind of hint that it's Sony's fault that the consumers didn't know they were being overcharged, like Sony was doing underhanded business tactics. When I just don't know if I believe that because Sony doesn't really do anything besides just have a platform with the game and the price next to it and you choose whether or not to buy it. But it's not like it was Sony that was doing anything to mislead them, at least not that I've ever seen. They just put the games on their service with how much they cost, and it's up to the consumer if they find it to be a reasonable price or not. But he also highlighted some things that helped Neil in her claim that Sony's TOS allows Sony to set the price of digital games and in-game content and charge a 30% commission on every purchase of digital games and in-game content from the PlayStation Store and that, quote, this results in excessive and unfair prices to consumers for their digital games and in-game content. Or such as the fact that Sony screws UK consumers by making a $70 game cost £70, which is like a $12 difference. And that would be outside the industry standard where the practice is to adjust their prices so that they're almost the same after conversion. But also you have people saying that's not always the case. Pointing to things like Elden Ring is $60 on the US store and just 50 pounds on the UK one. But also that discrepancy might actually end up helping the case because games like Elden Ring are made by independent publishers, meaning they get to dictate their price on the PlayStation store. Whereas you have games like God of War that are made by a Sony owned studio and thus the case of Sony directly dictating the price in a way that screws UK consumers. So you also have people saying that Neil makes it seem like Sony dictates all prices, which just isn't the case. So she's like half right. But ultimately that's where we are right now. We're gonna have to wait to see what happens. But uh, of course I wanna know everyone's thoughts with this but especially if you live outside of the u.s and you play games what are your thoughts about this right because for me with this specific story I'm, I'm like an outsider looking in trying to understand it whereas it's something that's directly impacting you that's also one of the things that's cool with the show is i'm just me but I, I get to have you as this funnel of information and then we should definitely talk about yesterday's primary elections in new york and florida right? because while there are still a few more primaries left this season these are the last of the major multi-state contests and so we should talk about some of the key takeaways from these final big races right off the bat there was one overall factor that shaped both of these primaries, gerrymandering. Well, Florida and New York are states with legislative maps that were among the most radically redrawn after the 2020 census debate for one party over the other. In New York, it was for the Democrats. In Florida, it was the Republicans. But also, it illustrated two very different possibilities of what can happen when a map is insanely gerrymandered. It's either tossed out by a court or it's allowed to stay in place. In New York, the state's highest court ordered the map to be redrawn again I'll because just keep Democrats doing this and the flipped many houses in their favor and undermined vulnerable Republicans. And we ended up seeing the more balanced redrawn map lumping several of the state's most high profile by lawmakers into one district, resulting in an incredibly chaotic and bitter primary that pitted members who were previously close allies against one another and ultimately ousted some long-standing prominent representatives. Meanwhile, in Florida, we saw the exact opposite with the state Supreme Court. They're refusing to block an insanely gerrymandered map. And when I say insanely gerrymandered, I mean insanely gerrymandered. King Florida man Ron DeSantis vetoing a congressional map passed by his own party seemingly because it did not include enough gerrymandering in his favor. The men making Republicans in the state legislature approve a different map that he drew that was way more partisan and gave Republicans a much bigger advantage. And while that move, of course, shows DeSantis's power over his party, it also isn't the only place that he really demonstrated his muscle yesterday. Because while he did not have a primary challenger, the candidates that he endorsed had very strong showing. And that including candidates that he backed in school board races that he put a massive amount of funding into in the final weeks of the primary. With at least 21 of the 30 people that he backed for school boards winning their elections yesterday. And that's incredibly significant because school board elections in Florida have been non-partisan for the better part of the last three decades. The good fortune for Republicans didn't just end there. In addition to winning, 
wins from DeSantis' candidates, his congressional map is also expected to give the GOP new House seats. And very notably there, as the Washington Post reports, most of those will be held by Trump's supporting Republicans, including some of the most far-right congressional candidates anyway. Which, side note, Laura Loomer almost won her fucking primary, only losing at this point by 7%, which is infinitely closer than she should ever be to holding a public office. But also, with this news day, we should talk about the Democrats, who recently have been having stronger showings, including in districts that Trump beat Biden in since Roe v. Wade has been overturned. And the boost that Roe's reversal has given Democrats was also on display in a closely watched special election for a congressional seat in a New York swing district. There, we saw Democrat Pat Ryan, who campaigned on a platform of defending abortion rights, soundly defeating his Republican opponent, with many seeing Ryan's race as an important test case to see if abortion will drive out voters in the general election, especially in swing states, which will play a heavy role in the battle for the control of Congress. Though, I do want to note there that Democrats are still slated to most likely lose the House. It's just that they may not get as spanked as once believed. But of course, polls are just polls, and what ends up happening from here hate to hate election day, we're going to have to wait to see. Also, notably for Democrats, we saw another really interesting trend continue with moderate world. Democrats beating out left-leaning challengers. Are in sure addition to establishment true. Dems fending off progressive challengers in New York, we saw Florida <sighs> Democrats picking Charlie Crist, the state's former Republican governor who switched to become a moderate Democrat to challenge DeSantis this fall. So a lot of moving parts on both sides of the aisle as we head into the general. In a lot of different ways, this incredibly consequential election can go. So keep your eyes open, pay attention to registration and mail-in voting deadlines, and of course, vote, vote, vote. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching and being subscribed to these daily dives in the news. Also, if you're looking for more news, I got you covered here or in the links down below. But of course, as always, my name's Phil. Oh, Frank and you've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. is racist. That is what some are saying when they look at the situation that we're going to talk about for today's first story. But so at the center of this, you have online creator Corey Kenshin putting out a new video where he asks this big question. YouTube, you guys either play favorites, you are racist, or it's a mix of the two. These are the three options, YouTube. Which one is it? So that video was posted yesterday. It is currently number one trending. And in that video, Corey outlines how he thinks that YouTube and its algorithm are racist and age restrict videos from black creators when non-black creators who post similar content don't see the same consequences. With saying he's felt this for a while, but never wanted to call it out. I never want to be that guy, oh, it's because I'm black. All oh, these issues are happening because I'm black. This time, I can no longer let it slide. But Corey then explaining last week, he uploaded a video where he played the mortuary assistant and it got age restricted. You know, he's not the only creator doing that. So he's like, okay, perfect time to compare and contrast. He looks at other creators playing that same game and it seemed like he was the only one who got restricted. So he appealed the decision, but it got rejected. He then reaches out to his YouTube content. who says that maybe it happened because at the end of the video, he includes a part of the game that involves a character battling depression. So Corey's like, okay, was I the only one that featured that same part? But then he stumbles across another creator's video, Markiplier. He's one of the biggest creators on the platform. Corey's saying he has a lot of respect for Markiplier. He's not trying Trying to drag him into this whole mess but your channel just has happens to be a great reference point because a you're a really big youtuber and b you're not black so i can look at your channel and then i can look at my channel or look at anyone else's channel and make sure that the things and the games that you play all that they're enforcing the rules equally to everybody Corey's saying that when he looked at it, Markiplier included the same content, but he wasn't age-restricted, so he reached out to his contact again to kind of be like, so, okay, what's the deal then? His contact then says, I'll contact the policy team, have them look at it, and then that video gets unrestricted, which understandably shocked Corey, considering they already rejected his appeal. Right? He thought, like, if anything, I'm accidentally screwing this other guy, they're going to double down, they're going to restrict Markiplier's video, but saying... But they looked at Mark's video... And they use that to verify my innocence. And so with all of that, Corey sends his YouTube rep an email saying, hey, I think there's racism and favoritism at play here, and I want to sit down with the policy team to talk things out. We're wanting to see, are human beings doing this? Is it automated? What's going on? Or because he doesn't feel like this is an isolated incident. Right? Every time he comes back to YouTube, he's trending for a bit, but then something happens to knock him down. So then, oh my God, his rep says, okay, I'm going to go to work for you. We're going to answer these questions. And after a few days, they re-age restrict his video. And then go on to age restrict Markiplier's video as well. They got caught with their pants down. They got called out, and then they had to go back and say, oh, whoa, 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 okay. We see the narrative that he's kind of pushing here. We need to take some steps back. We need to just age restrict them both and be done with it. Corey adding, he knows he can't directly prove that race had anything to do with this, but he added that we just don't know much about the people behind closed doors at YouTube that call these shots. And saying he feels this way, especially since this always happens to him right when he's seeing a lot of growth. And it always just comes off like, can't let this black guy 
it too high up. As well as saying, sure, he could be proved wrong here. And if he is proved wrong, he would apologize, but this is how it feels. I believe there is some racism involved within the policy team. And YouTube in general really doesn't care about black people like that. Or with Corey saying, yeah, they do spotlight black creators, but that doesn't mean anything. It's fake. They have their favorites and all that stuff. It's just for show. Before you're arguing, instead of pandering, when a black creator comes to you and says that they're being treated differently, don't do some weird song and dance. Actually do something to correct those wrongs. Also, this video, according to Corey, has been flagged for ad suitability. And the response to this video has been very, very big. Tons of comments and support commending him for speaking out, saying this issue deserves attention. Some people on Twitter calling out YouTube for flagging the video. Large creators like Gideon saying Susan Wojcicki should sit down with Corey and discuss these issues and of course with this story i'd love to know your thoughts but it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens here because this feels too big for youtube to ignore like Corey's not just some random creator he has over 14 million subscribers on the platform he's only posted four videos in the last i think four months and even with that he got a hundred million views in the last 30 days so only time will tell how big this snowball gets would have never got this out of hand if it wasn't for the franco guy let's watch some crazy stuff yo Kids been doing drugs. I thought this was a commercial. What, what's going on? I mean, don't don't worry about it. Let's just just see where this goes. That is uh, my way of paraphrasing the results from this new survey by the National Institutes of Health. Young adults are using marijuana and hallucinogens at an all-time record high. Specifically, finding that between April and October 2021, adults 19 to 30 use one of the substances at the highest rate since the agency first began recording in 1988. For weed, nearly 42.6% reported using pot in the last year, 28.5% in the last month, around 10.8% on a daily basis. And it's a very significant jump from just five years ago. And then when it comes to hallucinogens in this age group, eight out of 100 said they consumed hallucinogenic drugs in 2021, nearly double of what we saw five years ago. But also, the closer you look at the situation, the less surprising this trend is. It was about a decade ago when we first saw Colorado and Washington legalize it. Since then, 17 other states have followed suit, another 13 legalizing medical use. Also, th there's really not a stigma around it as much anymore. And while hallucinogens between the two are obviously more taboo, experts are saying they're seeing a similar trend with those. There are more and more mainstream conversations happening around these drugs. And in addition to an increasing number of jurisdictions moving to decriminalize certain hallucinogens, specifically mushrooms, there's also been this growing movement of people utilizing drug-assisted therapies using substances like MDMA and ketamine. And while anecdotal, I'll say, I know some people that do this, and it's been fucking game-changing for them. I mean, it feels like every week or every month, there's like some new big study. One of the most recent ones was talking about how psilocybin or magic <sighs> mushrooms, it could actually help people stop heavy drinking. Oh, of course, with this, you still have people concerned about this massive jump. But for example, Dr. Nora Volkov, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which publishes the annual survey, saying, Overall, the results are very concerning. What they tell us is that the problem of substance abuse among young people has gotten worse in this country and that the pandemic, with all its mental stressors and turmoil, has likely contributed to the rise. While my opinions on hallucinogens and marijuana seem to differ with this person, I think we're going to have a disagreement about what all this means. Still, I think that if we continue to look at the data, we find very good news. And that is that I found a historically low use of cigarettes, alcohol, and opioids in this same year. Though, that, that's probably only meaningful with opioids and alcohol since the cigarettes like that's just getting replaced with vaping but hey with all that said i like to ask these questions now and then because people's opinions change with time what are your thoughts right now about hallucinogens and marijuana so shout out philly d okay philly can i get some more thumbnails please i gotta get more outrageous here and then you know being careful when you're online is key because when you're not careful hackers can gain access to your computer your bank account info or worse and it's on that note of security that i want to take a second to thank the fantastic partner and sponsor of today's show nordvpn and more directly nord nordvpn.com slash phil. NordVPN is an international company focusing on security, convenience, and access to content. They've also expanded their this operations and there's a lot of new features that come with the software that makes it worth the investment. Like Nord's threat protection feature that neutralizes cyber threats before they can do any real damage to your device. It makes browsing safer, smoother, and helps identify malware-written files, stopping me from landing on malicious websites, and blocking trackers and intrusive ads on the spot. And get this, once you enable threat protection, it's constantly on the lookout even when you're not connected to a VPN. A lot of these functions are at work in the background all the time. I don't even have to think about it. So head on over to nordvpn.com slash fail to get a huge discount on a two-year plan and wait for it four months free. It's an absolutely incredible deal. Seriously, so that's nordvpn.com slash fail. It's all risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. It's socialism. That is what Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and many other Republicans are calling Biden's loan forgiveness. Calling the policy astonishingly unfair and saying President Biden's student loan socialism is a slap in the face to every family who sacrificed to save for college, every graduate who paid their debt, and every American who chose a certain career path or volunteered to serve in our armed forces in order to avoid taking on debt. Senator Ted Cruz also calling this a Hail Mary before the midterms. Which, hey, 
is a statement that the cynical part of my brain does not dismiss. It can be two things at the same time, a political move and at the same time something that genuinely will help millions of Americans. Now, with all that, I will say something that's surprising is, you know, we knew that Republicans were going to push back on this, but we've actually seen a decent amount of pushback from a number of Democrats, especially with more centrist Democrats, people like Representative Tim Ryan, who's an Ohio Senate nominee, and he said, waiving debt for those already on a trajectory to financial security sends the wrong message to millions of Ohioans without a degree working just as hard to make ends meet. As well as Democrat and former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers saying every dollar spent on student loan relief is a dollar that could have gone to support those who don't get an opportunity to go to college. We've also seen competing narratives regarding who this is actually going to help, with a number of people citing an independent study from the Penn Wharton budget model, which said that knocking out $10,000 for people making less than $125,000 a year would cost the government $300 billion. Also saying that at minimum, 69% of the debt forgiven would go to households in the top 60% of the income distribution. But we've seen pushback against that from Biden and his administration, saying that among other things, with the income cap, the relief's going to make sure the money goes to who needs it most. And saying that 90% of those affected by this loan forgiveness are going to be households making $75,000 or less per year. But also, while all of this is happening, you still have a number of Democrats pushing against this, saying, hey, this doesn't do enough. With some saying even more debt needs to be forgiven. But even more pointing to the fact that college just, the, the cost is insane. The cost of tuition has gone up in a way that just, it doesn't make any sense. And because of that, it's just kind of a small band-aid on a gushing wound. You know, it's been a while since I went to college, so when I saw reports about the price of college now, it's just insane. Reportedly, per the College Board, average in-state tuition for a four-year public university is $9,410 per year. If you're an out-of-state student, that's $23,890 per year. And then, if you're looking at a private university, right, if you take into account all four years, to get a diploma, it averages to $130,000. Meanwhile, last year, the median family income before taxes was less than $80,000. And that's without the books, the room, the board, the that's in what? And of course, why wouldn't these greedy colleges continue to raise the prices? In their eyes, they essentially have a money printing machine and no one's really keeping them in check because in this country, that's just considered a part of life, which is why for a while now we've seen people floating possible solutions, though not gaining a ton of traction. Some ideas include revoking the tax-exempt status of schools that exceed tuition inflation limits. Some also think it would be a good idea to deny federal research grants to a number of schools for the belief this could rein in especially large public and private universities. But for now, that's where we are, and we'll have to wait to see what happens. Thoughts on Philip DeFranco's comments? That guy's, still, that guy's channel's still relevant? And then, you know, it's been exactly three months to the day since a gunman walked into Rob Elementary and slaughtered 19 children and two teachers. And now the latest update that we have to the situation came during a school board meeting to determine what should be done about police chief Pete Arredondo. He was the guy who wasted an hour trying to talk to the shooter, trying to get into nearby classrooms, and waiting for keys to the one that the shooter was in, even though it was unlocked. But then reportedly choosing not to attend the meeting yesterday, saying that he had received death threats and didn't feel safe. But him not being there didn't stop community members from pouring into this high school auditorium and unleashing their anger on the school board. If it was one of your children, heads would be rolling right now but because it's not you don't care i have messages for pr and i know it on the law enforcement that were there that date People in the audience shouting cowards and no justice, no peace. Brett Cross, an uncle of one of the victims, unexpectedly jumping on stage and handing a letter to the board demanding that it hold deliberations out in the open. Do not take this into closed session. We deserve to hear. Our babies are dead. Our teachers are dead. Our parents are dead. The least y'all can do is show us the respect to do this in the public. Others backing up, but after all of that, the school board goes into a closed session. They come back around 90 minutes later, and this happens. to terminate the non-certified contract that he added on the effective immediately. Uh, you hear some light applause and people yelling. Uh, Otherwise, though, it's a bittersweet reaction. Yes, Arredondo's lost his job. Some people seeing that as accountability, but these families still have to live the rest of their lives with empty chairs at the dinner table. And as far as what Arredondo has had to say about this, right, was he humble? Was he apologetic? He was no, fuck no. Instead, releasing a statement through his lawyer, blasting the whole meeting and saying, Chief Arredondo will not participate in his own illegal and unconstitutional public lynching and respectfully request the board immediately reinstate him with all back pay and benefits and close the complaint as unfounded, alleging that the board fired him without giving him a chance to publicly clear his name, effectively defaming him, and defending his actions at the shooting, saying that he and his officers saved as many lives as they could with the tools available, and claiming that Arredondo was being forced into the role of the fall guy, the sacrificial lamb, with him even accusing the Department of Public Safety head of racism, saying that when he blamed Arredondo, it was a smokescreen attempt to blame the Mexicans. So yeah, that's where that fucking mess is right now. And so we'll have to wait to see what happens, but in the meantime, let me know your thoughts on this one. But ultimately, that is where that story ends today's show ends.
As always, thank you for watching and subscribing to my daily dives in the news. And if you want more news, I got you covered here or in the links down below. And of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, remember these? <laughs> Assault in broad starlight. And while we're all impressed with John Barillaro's incredible MMA moves, I think that it's a bit of a tragedy that Matt Costello, the cameraman, that he was completely and utterly perfect gaming received $14,000 worth of damages on his camera, which trades, you know what I'm talking about here, right? It's just like John Barillaro took off his tool belt and was just like, chuck it out into the beach, go swim for it, Stooge. That's what he did to that man's life. He has a damage back to begin with. So can you imagine that? Some teeny little troll man coming up going, no, no, stop filming me, stop filming me. As you have one of those 50 year old backs of being like, uh, 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 it's a heavy camera. You know how heavy those cameras are? I don't know the exact weight, but they're heavy, aren't they? It's like we're wearing several cinder blocks on one side of your shoulders. The microphone's been thrown away. That's just gone. So I don't know. They just obviously didn't get the message. In tournament rules, there's no items. He's been out of work for weeks because he's a freelancer. So he doesn't have any money coming in. He's just sitting at home, damaged, with all of his equipment damaged. And the police are taking their sweet time for some... I, I really can't fathom the reason as to why they'd be doing that, you know? Uh, seeing as there's a guy that can set up a special police force that can crack down on someone the very day that they even slightly annoy him, slash maybe questionably, according to him, if you're being generous, assault his feelings. But, you know, when that same man assaults someone, straight up assaults, you can say it because, John... You were filmed, you fucking idiot. You were filmed. You were filmed on the camera that you were fucking damaging, <laughs> assaulting him, right? And yet the police are sitting around going, oh, I just uh, think we need to gather some more evidence on this one. What? No! We're not going to let that happen. You know why I'm saying we? Because we're using your funds, whether you like it or not. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here because this is a huge announcement. You're going to like this. You know that massive legal war chest that we set up for getting all of those uh, civil cases against the fixated persons unit and other associates surrounding it? This one is going to be fairly low cost in comparison to those things. It doesn't take lawyers crawling through endless documents, months to end at a minimum, to get like even the case together. Uh, this is just a straight up, okay, here we go, here's legitimately what happened, camera never lies. This is going to be a pretty much open and shut court case. It's going to be very fast, so it's going to be a small amount of the overall money, and I think that we owe it to this guy. Don't you? Really, he did take one for the team on that. That's like the rugby player that just goes out and injures himself so that their star player doesn't score another try, yeah? So we owe it to him. Make sure that that guy gets the justice that he is getting denied at the moment. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, and by the way, best law firm in the city, nay the world, the real life Better Call Saul, if they're actually moral, Xenophon Davis, are going to be representing Matt, the same guys that represented both me and Christo. So you know that they're going to be fighting for you, Sydney. Better Call Saul. And we will see you very soon with some more updates on the matter. But right now I have another update that's probably even bigger than that, which is that I am going to Melbourne. And I'm going to Melbourne for, I think, from the 23rd to the 27th, so come on down, because it is like the Da Vinci Code 
uh, with a lot more penis references in it, which is kind of shame, because, which, is, which is truly amazing, because we're talking about Renaissance art here a lot of the time when it comes to Dan Brown's work, and there's even more than that. But yeah, just mind expanding stuff, you'll walk out of it just being like, oh my God, I can't see the world the same way again. So come see that if you're in Melbourne. And next up on the Shilling Train Express, if John Barillaro hasn't been in the news enough for your likings, Check out our video that we released at an extremely odd time, I've got to say. Like, this is before Oz Aerobics is on television. It was 5 a.m. on a Saturday. But nonetheless, Coronation Property, check it out. Because, my God, if you thought that John Barillaro was a heavy hitter, check out where he used to work. It was toe-curling stuff. Especially for the man who almost got his toes cut off. Allegedly. Anyway, we'll see you around. Like and subscribe. Please share and comment below. Comment. We're not in the studio and actually have a background. Yeah, no green screen here. Pure glass, baby. You know what that is? Melbourne. You know why I'm here? Probably because we've been advertising it incessantly. And I choose to do it again. I'm at Melbourne because I'm doing my live show. Come see it. It's going to be a night of red pills, one after the other. You're just going to come out. Your mind's going to be so expanded. Some people's brains explode. There's no refunds if that happens. Buy beware, okay? So make sure that you get your tickets at friendlyjoinings.com. And now for the uh, secondary piece of information that this entire video is about, which is breaking as of mm, probably over a week ago. <laughs> Sorry that we were late on this one. <laughs> but Scott Morrison, shock horror, is dodgy. Did you know that? Well, apparently the rest of the mainstream press did not. And they only discovered it very conveniently when Scott Morrison was safely tucked into the back benches, which, yes, there is a lot of legal questions that this raises, obviously. But I think that the bigger question that no one has been asking is, why is Scott Morrison still in Parliament? Surely he has better job prospects than that. He did so much for coal. Is he still so bad that when he goes over to him and says, okay, Shav, I, I can just shit on a board where I'm not actually supposed to do anything and get paid 500 grand a year to do it, right? And they're just like, no, I'm just I'm going to be honest with you, Scott. We never liked your company. Is this at all he has? I mean, I know those chairs are comfy, but there's got to be some other job that has better perks for it. It's just embarrassing being there. And time, just go. Go away. Um, but yes, all right, so we'll talk about the fact that he's had uh, many, many roles that he was playing while being Prime Minister at the same time, which really does reinforce my previous point of, surely, if you were at the same time as being Prime Minister, uh, the Minister for Resources and the Treasurer and the Minister for Health, surely that is a impressive enough resume to canter out the fact that where the bloody hell are you didn't do as successfully as they hoped. But apparently not. And I really do like the fact that in Scott Morrison's mind, the reason that he had to do this is because he's this Winston Churchill-esque Prime Minister, except for not facing anywhere near the level of casualty rates. And he uh, didn't have the nuts even to come out and publicly say that he had all of these wartime measures. He had to keep that a secret to himself. I think, God, my God, causing a near constitutional crisis just because you like to micromanage. You know what the other part is that I think that the press has just completely glossed over almost entirely is that the only reason that anyone knows about this is because Scott Morrison, or hearing that people were writing, you know, memoirs of him, I suppose, or a book, or, you know, they were, they were collecting something of his time in office. And he tells these journos, hey, yeah, uh, just a little humble brag for you. I uh, secretly swore myself into many portfolios at once, meaning that many of the checks and balances of the Westminster system were taken out because of how hard I found it to sleep at night. I had to take mild sedatives. And what is a mild sedative, by the way? Is it Tixi Weeks? What the hell is this? It's, it really doesn't even sound like he was that upset if it was mild sedatives. 
not mild enough to essentially become a secret dictator, which I do like the other aspect of this, which is that there are a lot of liberals coming out and decrying Scott Morrison and how he should step down immediately, which that's something new. It does truly astonish me that as soon as someone has no power, all of a sudden everybody grows a backbone. But I do also have to commend Peter Dutton for coming out and really pretty much just very strongly being like, no, no, you can do what he wants, you like, that's fine. And you know why I think that is? I think that secretly he's realised, oh, I can do the same thing. <laughs> so he's just, I, I think this is the thing that if, if, if you were going to uh, step back for a moment and think about it for a second, it was kind of like one of those things of, yeah, it's theoretically possible to do this, but no one ever was that tenacious to do it. You know, so that really shows how far the general norms of parliament declined in the era of Scott Morrison. Because he also used this as an example, uh, just for example, sorry, uh, when it came to debates in parliament, when it came to parliamentary procedure of the opposition being able to ask questions, all of that was squeezed down to its rawest form. Just, just nasty things. I mean, Jesus. Nobody hears what the Labour Party says anyway. But Scott Morrison wouldn't give them the chance to just look him in the eye and say, where is all this grant money going? Which brings me to my next point. If this is what comes out of his mouth, as in, he thought this was a good thing, and he's not particularly ashamed of it, wanted that to come out to the public, can you imagine what is going to be uncovered when Labor finally sets up a federal ITAC? Oh, man. I am licking my uh, oddly dry lips up here. I think it's because you're in one of these Melbourne skyscrapers where the altitude changes. I'm pretty much Mount Everest level at the moment. But regardless, they'd be dry nonetheless because once that information comes out, that is going to be explosive. Every single that can, can you imagine a government that was that confident in itself? And by government, I just mean how you know how they always say something like the Morrison government. It truly was the first time in Australian history the Morrison government. It is going to be phenomenal. How much extremely not just a like immoral because it really seems like the press doesn't really care what is and isn't moral. Like I, I do think that a major reason that the press is so angry about this as opposed to all the other stuff. I mean, look, I made a career out of bitching about how bad Scott Morrison is because I'm just leaving it in the trash every day. It was like going to one of those rich guy houses and just being like, you need a perfectly good cantaloupe, like every day, you know? Um, but if that's the case of what's on public record, imagine what will be found in discovery. Imagine. It's just going to be, like, this is the thing that I think no one else is looking at. This is what Scott Morrison thinks is good. What is that man hiding that he is ashamed of? And you know that he must be ashamed of a lot because he thought that going on holiday wasn't good. He just did that out of bureaucratic habitual habit, like a goose migrating from South America to Australia. That was... Just, that was instinctual. He had to do that, but you had to do that, and he hid it. He must be doing a bunch of stuff that he and routinely hides, because we did a video on him ages ago. You can go look it up if I could remember what it's called, and I can't, but we did a video on him. It was very long, but a lot of it was just going through all of these little pencil-pushing games that he did throughout his entire career before he even won a seat, and this is just endemic of that man's entire life. It's just playing these little bullshit pencil-pushing games to give himself a little bit more power to the point that it was like, you're already Prime Minister. Why do you have to push the envelope further than that? Surely if you just say to someone in the meeting, you just kind of make that awkward pause and go, eh. yeah, 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 we'll, we'll consider that, Barnaby. You don't need to take his portfolio. He's just going to awkwardly shuffle away. He's not going to push for it. And this is the other thing as well, like, if it comes out that it's true that what he did was just use it once to do something that admittedly seems quite noble, albeit for the usual non-noble reasons of he's just going to cost me change, but if it comes out that he did more than that, 
I guess that is kind of just justified in his mind at least, right? But to just have that power purely because he's just got a thing for that, like he just likes just being like, yeah, another title. And he's just it's like, you know, like it's like a secret little badge collection that he has. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was like it was like almost just a hobby. How much can I push uh, bullshit little rules and norms and get away with it? It really just seems like it was just pathological. Anyway, that was my perspective. But what's your perspective? Let me know in the comments. Make sure that you like this video because the truth must come out. Well, it doesn't really have to this time. But like the video anyway because as we previously mentioned, this is all the presents talking about. Anyway, come see my Melbourne show as well. Please. By asking a favour, two favours actually, don't eat while you're watching this video, you may spew, and the second favour is come and see me live, my final shows of 2022 are coming around, I'm heading to New Zealand on these three dates in these beautiful parts of the world, then I'm heading to Sydney, the factory theatre, because I've already played Sydney, in Western Sydney, I thought I'd better go to the city as well, I'm also going to Wollongong on that date, Perth on these two dates, don't forget to go to fucking Perth, motherfucker. You've got to go to Perth and see the good people who are living back in time in Australia. I love it. And the Sunshine Coast and Toowoomba. I love yous. I can't wait to see yous. You will not see me touring for another two years because there's things happening in my life. But I'll tell you what, I can't wait to see you soon. Oh, the ticket link's is at Butterfield.com. Go and get them. Bye. I understand, ladies and gentlemen, that in our new woke world, where we have to be polite to absolutely everyone and not harm anyone's delicate sensibilities, that some things will change. But also, as a brave man, I must draw a line in the sand and say, enough! I will not yield at this position, all right? You've gone too far. The Times in the UK report that doctors set out medical guidelines for trans men giving birth, which is not a problem because some trans men, they live their lives as men, and they still have vaginas and all the bits and bobs give birth. That's fine. And as I say, in a polite society, we need to do our best to make people feel welcome. I'm all about that. I will say, though, I still will not say that men can give birth. I'll say that trans men can give birth, but men can't have babies. That, remember that that got me banned from TikTok permanently and I had to fucking go through the back channels to get my TikTok account back? Yeah, I, that's fucking ridiculous. But men still can't have babies. Get over it. I know some trans fucking activists get angry at me for saying that and say that I hate them and I'm hurting people by saying it. Don't give a shit. You're wrong. I believe transgender men can have babies, but not natural born biological men. Why? Because men don't have wounds. There we go. And I also believe that trans people should be loved and valued, okay? I'm just laying that all out there so you can't get mad. But one of the things we have been seeing a lot of that has changed is words that we use. Words that we use apparently are so important because words are violence, okay? We've heard that before. We need to change words to make people feel more welcome. And I'm not necessarily against that, but there's just some words that when they change them to other words and then everyone's got to fucking use it or they're a bigot, I get the shits. And in this case, I'm fucking grossed out. Now, it's not just trans activists that want this to happen or have made this happen. It's places like PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of cows or whatever they fucking get up to. They wanted this change when people were referring to animals. You can't call someone a chicken. No, that's offensive to chickens. You've got to call them a coward. If someone's being a snake, you don't say that. They're being a jerk. If they're being a pig, they're not calling them a pig because those oinkers will be upset. They have to be called Repulsive. So it's not just people saying that men can have babies, it's saying that chickens shouldn't be called chickens. Now these words, these changes, these uh, introductions of nuanced ways of thinking to dialect, what a great sentence Isaac, have been coming in for the last 20 years or so. Slight changes. Now obviously the Peter one's never going to happen because no one takes them seriously. But in the real world, people like trans activists have brought in these new ideas about words, like the whole they-them situation. And as much as that annoys me, I'm not going to call someone a they-them, it is brought into the lexicon and people use that. It has been around for a long time, though, the last couple of decades, let's say. Actor, 
men used to be actors and women used to be actresses. Now everyone's just an actor. Female scientists, male scientists, just scientists. And I, I, I think that these are great. These are necessary. These are just parts of us growing as a society. But then you got people pushing a little bit too hard. You can't apparently blacklist someone because that's racist. Someone's not a guru anymore, that's culturally insensitive. And this one's real as well, you can't walk someone through something because some people can't walk. Do you see what's happening here? Slowly over time, regular normal language is being eroded and replaced with things that no one would ever actually use. If you don't play by the rules, you can be cancelled. I can't be cancelled. So I don't have to play by the rules and I can call it out for the bullshit that it is. And yes, I think you should do your best to be kind, but here, right here is where I draw the line. Are you ready? I draw the line at this. The Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, Position Statement and Guidelines, Infant Feeding and Lactation Related Language and Gender, and the Position, alright? And I'm not even talking about what you think I'm going to talk about, chest feeding, no, no. That's been around for thousands of years, I'm sure of it, right? I'm talking about how far they go into that concept, okay? For example, in an attempt, this is a, an excerpt, for an attempt to be more gender inclusive, the word parent is often substituted for mother. But in many languages, parent is the masculine noun. That could mean father. Oh, my God. Many languages have no gender neutral equivalent for relevant words. For example, in many languages, here it comes, the term breast milk slash human milk is mother's milk. Other terms could be used as well, such as expressed milk. This is a real, like, paper that they did. Are you ready for the other term that you could use to be more gender inclusive to breastfeeding mothers and fathers and gender neutrals? Father's milk. Father's milk. No, no. You, Dad, get your fucking milk away from me, you freak. I am not sucking on anything that will disperse father's milk into my mouth. Do these people even know what father's milk means? Who? Urban Dictionary does. Ma, how did you get on last night with that new lass of yours? Martin, well, she had a mouthful of father's milk, meaning semen, jizz, sperm, cum. Father's milk is jizz. We cannot have a new generation of gender inclusive language where we tell people that my baby is ingesting father's milk. No. There's even a category on Pornhub called father's milk. I hate to be the person to say this, but woke people have gone too far. This whole thing is too far. Suggesting that men can give birth through their penises and without fucking wombs and their <coughs> breast, chest feed, their father's milk. That is not a good way to raise a child. That's a good way to give them a crippling mental illness. Cancel me. I don't care. Cancel me. Fucking do it. Fuck you. Fuck you to the moon. No children in the world are ingesting father's milk. And if they are, the dad should be arrested. And I bet you any money, any money in the world, right, that there are no trans people who are pushing for this. No logical trans person wants to tell their baby to enjoy daddy's milk. No one. This whole thing stinks of politicians and bureaucrats trying to fucking show how fucking good they are and virtue signal how fucking amazing they are. It is bullshit. No one wants fucking father's milk, all right? And if you do, get out. Get out of this fucking video, you big creep. And also in saying that, I don't think father's milk will catch on. So what I've done, because I'm an intellectual, I've come up with many other names that they could use that is gender inclusive, but not as gross as father's milk. Not as gross. Daddy's white stuff. Still gross, but not as bad. Creamy peck sauce. Mmm, father, please, 
Spill some of your creamy peck sauce down your hairy chest. Gross. Um, manly mayonnaise. That's another classic. I enjoy that. Uh, Claire, actually, my wife came up with that one. Well done. Ricky Martin's titty giblets. Remember we got accused of fucking incest? Hilarious. Big Daddy's tit milk would even be better. All of those are gross, but not as gross as father's milk. I'm all for inclusive language and making everyone feel nice and welcome and live your best fucking life and all that higgledy piggledy shit. But when it comes to father's milk, I will not yield. It comes down to this, okay? If you are such a minority that you demand that father's milk is a thing, maybe your opinion doesn't matter. And maybe you should just get on with your life and leave everybody else alone, you fucking psycho. I'm sorry, but one or two people out of the thousands of people that exist in the world that happen to be transgender men who are having babies, if there are one or two of you that want to use the word father's milk, fine. But don't put it in a study, don't put it in the newspaper, and do not declare that people need to use it. All right, you fucks. Ladies and gentlemen, be a good motherfucker. Peace to the Middle East. Big extinct. Come and see me live. I'm all over the... Well, not all over. I've been to a lot of places already. But this is the tail end. The best part. This is... You know what I'm talking about. IsaacButterfield.com. Come and see me. Uh, be a good motherfucker. Peace to the Middle East. Big extinct. Bye-bye. <laughs>